If money is a hot topic in your relationship, this episode's going to be just a doozy for you. It's going to be amazing. This is my final episode on my women's month of March for International Women's Day. I kind of made it a whole month um, focus on interviewing amazing women who are doing great work. And Elizabeth is a therapist who specializes in helping couples navigate the complexity of talking about money. So we all know that money is like usually the top three topics of conflict in any kind of relationship, whether you've been married for 35 years or have just started dating, money is a hot topic. Elizabeth shares so much with us, but what's really amazing is she talks a lot about money dates and she breaks down how to be purposeful about conversations that take away the emotional tension that comes when we talk about money and breaking things down into manageable ways, but she provides a structure, which I absolutely love. I love this conversation. If money's a hot topic for you, this is one for you. I'm trust me when I tell you, you need a notebook. You're going to write one. I write this down and you're going to want to share this episode with your significant other. So you can start having different conversations. I'm so glad you're here, and I know that you're going to love this episode. Let's get going. Welcome to Mental Makeover Radio, your go-to destination for meaningful conversations about mental health. I'm your host and your trusted therapist bestie, Cecilia Manella. Join us as we explore the complexities and messiness of human experience by addressing your questions and concerns. I'm here to provide a straightforward and practical therapy advice. So grab your favorite beverage, whether it's tea, coffee, or whatever tickles your taste buds, and get ready to embark on a mental makeover. Welcome to Mental Makeover Radio. I am here with my friend and colleague, Elizabeth McGinnis. Welcome to the podcast, Elizabeth. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. So excited to have you here. Yes. Before we dive into a listener's question, tell us about like, who are you? How'd you come to be where you are? Who was little Elizabeth? Give it, <laughs> spill the tea a little bit on your story. Oh my God. This is such a long story. Like, I don't <laughs> have one. This wasn't like you knew what you were going to do and you went there. Um, I started off as an army brat, which meant I moved every two to three years my whole life, wow. um, which meant I was constantly in observer mode, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of things I missed as you do, um, but I had to get really good really fast at observing or it was going to take way too fucking long to make friends <laughs> um, because by the time you did, like you were on to the next You're group. on to the next place. Right. You had to make friends. Um, and so, yeah, I got really, really good observing. And you would think that would make me a good observer of myself, but not really. Like, <laughs> you're, thinker, you're oblivious. Like, it just made me good at observing other people. Um, and I also was a 90s kid. Like, I was a 90s teenager, mm -hmm. which meant the dot com, dot com was coming up, all that good stuff. And I go away to college, and I did what all fun, stupid kids do, which is I totally took a boy's advice and went into computers because he was into computers. And that's, Of course. Yeah, why not? What university totally did you go to? Through. I went to James Madison University. It's a university in Virginia. Okay. And um, it's not completely a party school, but it's like, <laughs> got its range of party going on. Um, I could have gone to, like, you can get all snobby about all of them, and I could tell you all the oh, dirt. For sure. The real it is was like, it was a good school that yeah. had a good enough social scene, and it was far enough away from my parents that they couldn't drop in on me on Perfect. the ranch. So it, fit, it checked the boxes. So I ended up in computers and I was starting to question, like, is this a good idea? And bam, the dot-com bubble bursts, 9-11 happens and the entire economic world shuts Changes. down. Changes, yeah. And I was like, uh, I need a job right? and computers pays and nobody else is hiring. <laughs> so <laughs> I was one of four people with a job offer when I graduated. Wow. Um in my class, I was like one of four girls, four people got job offers from our, cause like the year before nobody got job offers right. and we got it. And so not only was I going into computers, which I wasn't in love with, but guess what? And it. I also went into military contracting because they were literally the only people hiring. Wow. Um, so what was it, it was like, not, what was it like being like 
how big was your cohort? So you're, you're four, one of four women in the program. 265 computer science majors. I was 265. Only... What was that like? Being... Oh, you cannot skip class because I remember vividly my software engineering class, the professor's like going through the, the list on the first day. There's like 35 in the class. And he goes, and Elizabeth, we're so happy to see. You're the only girl. You are the only girl wow. in class. Everybody knows who you are. Right. Every single person. There is no skipping class. <laughs> <laughs> um, the flip side of this, I had my pick of partners. Um, there was, uh, I got to pick whoever I wanted to be my partner. In class. <laughs> who doesn't want to be the partner of the girl? Right. And no, I'm not gonna lie. I was I was pretty enough to to get some offers, especially when you're you've only got three other girls. <laughs> right. In competition. So, um, it's computer science in college was really fun. Being in military contracting as an engineer, male dominated plus male dominated, uh, that was rough. It did a number on me. It was very. I would not recommend it to to anybody out there. Like it was, it was really brutal. Um, the flip side is when me too came out and these stories came out, I was like, girl, you yeah. have no fucking idea what you're talking about. Like right. you do not know what sexual harassment is. You want a sexual harassment, go into <laughs> engineering in military, military. Contracting, and, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, so that, yeah, I only lasted about six years in that. Um, because it was just, you say it, only it, like, it's like such a little, like, measly time but six years is a long time to be in that organizational culture yeah um and at that time yes yeah because this was early 2000s mm -hmm. um but you part of what sucks you in is like you work on some cool like i know rando interesting <laughs> things about how the government works um and they're not classified or anything but like who knows how case management works for the fbi like i do I oh, fine. But <laughs> you don't know that. Like how, do, like, how do you find that out? Or like, I know how to order a tank. Like, why oh. do I know how to order a tank? Because I helped build the procurement system. Like, it's just weird. It's weird, right. weird stuff that you end up knowing. <laughs> um, and you get to do like rando. Like, I remember I got sent out on a field project up to Canada. Right. It was my first trip to Canada because I was monitoring. Where did you go? Kingston, 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 Ontario. Yes. Yeah. Because I was monitoring RFID technology between the border crossings. Right. Okay. So, I mean, like some of that was super boring, but like the flip side is I talked to all these rando border cops who mm -hmm. like, oh, they sent a girl up here to talk to me. Like, of course they chatted my ear right. off. Um, my hotel almost burned down like with me in it. So like uh, there's this whole story about a fire. There ended up being like some sort of sniper. And I don't know the details. So I don't know if it was exaggerated or what was going on. But like all this nonsense happened on this field trip just to measure RFID technology. Like, Oh my gosh. That's the best. I love it. Yeah. You learn like so love many weird. So like, yeah, you're dealing with this like really toxic culture. And right. at the same time, you're like, oh, but I get to do what? Like get I get to learn about cool what? Things. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I did that six years. One of those things is I got a call. Um, I'm, I don't want to say I'm impulsive, but I am a person who likes adventure. Clearly, like after 16 years being an army brat, like the idea of moving is not freaking scary. The idea right. of changing is not scary. So I get this phone call that's like, hey, we've got this job offer in California. And I'm like, California's the land of engineers. Why are you calling me? And they're like, well, to be honest, it nobody here can pass a drug test because you have to have a street <laughs> And I'm like, get out. Fair enough. Uh, no way. Like, Let me come out for the interview, see what it's like. So I fly oh out. Oh my God. Um, and that was the last two years of this is I was in California um, in this engineering position because I could pass a drug test. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's yeah. a really great way to get hired is because, well, you don't do drugs. So we need, we really need that. So yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So I spent the last two years um, on Alameda working with the Coast Guard and the Navy doing fun stuff for them. Um, but the flip side is I was in a bunker, like I was in a skiff, a bunker, right. you don't have access to Facebook. You don't have access to your cell phone. You don't have access to all this stuff. So like all this crazy stuff is going around. I'm meeting all these technology, all this cool stuff. And like, I'm in a bunker. Right. So even though like, that's cool, but I also can't talk about it. Right. Like I spent the, it's funny. I ended up in therapy where I can't talk about my clients because I spent the first it's six the years same thing. not able to talk about my job. <laughs> 
So I'm like, you know what? I'm out here. I'm done with this. I want to try something new. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try the startup world. I get a job at a startup. It's got its own toxicity, whatever. And then guess what happens? Boom, 2008. Financial crisis. Everybody stops hiring. I'm like, God damn it. I feel cursed. Like, it's just like, Here we go again. Here we go again. Um, but now I'm in .com. And right. I was kind of over technology. Like, I got to be honest. Like, I was yeah. just so over it. I did not care about the latest iPhone. I didn't care about, like, what is going on. Um, so I started leaning in less to my engineering, and I started moving into product management because the number one skill you need as a product manager is you start interviewing your clients. Right. And boy, did I like that. Like, yes. I didn't want to have to translate it into a product, <laughs> but <laughs> I really liked interviewing all those people. And so, like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And um, then I had one particularly bad boss who, I, I'm not, it's funny, we, I get together with the alums. I'm not going to name the client or, or the company or anything, yeah. but like, I get together with some of the alums from this company. And it's basically a domestic violence situation. Like, we're right. all traumatized. We all like left and like had to rebuild ourselves. And right. I ended up taking a year off. And I was just like, I can't, like, I need to figure this out. Like, am I going to double down on technology or am I going to do something else? Like I'm in my thirties. It's time to figure this out. And so I took a year off and I was like, what do I actually like? And. Which is by the way, such a powerful and hard question yeah. when you're, I mean, I think it's hard when you're like young and just going into college, you're like, what do I like? What am I doing? But also it's a really difficult question to ask yourself when you've had some experience because it's, I, I think it's just, it's co much more complicated. Oh, for sure. Cause you're not just thinking about like, what do I like? What do I like for the right price point? Right. What, I, what am I willing to sacrifice for what I like? Yes. I know that whatever I like, there's also going to be bullshit. So right. how much does it actually matter? Right. Um, and what the deciding factor, there was two deciding factors because I almost went back to technology, but the two deciding factor was I'm actually fueled a lot by boredom. If I get bored, I check out really fast. And I basically was like, if I go back to, tech to, to technology, which I am so bored by, I'll either get fired or I'll just quit again <laughs> in five years. Like, because I'm just so bored. Like, I'm right. just so bored. And I'm like, okay, like if you're that bored, you, you have to do something different. Right. And the second one was, it was like, okay, you're – Either way, you do not have enough. You have enough saved up so that you can take some risks, but you do not have enough saved up that you can just retire to an island somewhere. Right. Okay. So you're going to be working either way for another 30, 40 years. Okay. If you're going to be working for 30 years, <laughs> let's do something you like, even if it pays a little bit less. Like, let's at least 100%. do something you like. Totally agree. Yeah. And so I was, I asked myself, I didn't realize I was doing this at the time, but I asked myself the miracle question, the straight up, like, if you won the lottery, if you had $10 million, what would you do? And I was like, oh my God, I'd be a therapist. I get to sit down and talk to people about their lives all day long. Like mm -hmm. that sounds freaking amazing. Like I absolutely right. do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I chose. I was like, okay, well, look, if you don't get into grad school, you go back to tech. Let's just apply to grad school. See what happens. Apply to grad school. Got in. I was like, Oh, class is starting January. I was like, uh, okay. Okay, I guess we're doing this. Um, I did take a couple of prereqs because, again, I'd been a computer science right. major, not a psych major. Um, but less than I thought because um, I'd had a pretty good undergrad education that, like, filled in. I hadn't even realized it, but, like, part of gen ed was, like, psych 101. So I was like, right. oh, I already got that. Oh, stats, I already did a bunch of those. Like, right. I only had one or two I had to follow up on. Um, I got into a great grad program. I really liked it. Um, I met some amazing people. It was fabulous. But in the back of my mind was like, oh, well, if this turns out to be a mistake, I can always go back to tech right. um, and take all these skills. And I would be a way better product manager now than I would have been back then just because of everything I learned. Right. Um, but then I started therapy. And yes, there was the bullshit I didn't like, uh, but so much of it I loved. Right. So, so much of it I loved. And um, – it's funny because I was in grad school with a bunch of 26-year-olds who are there for completely different reasons, and they're way more idealistic. They're all like, I want to save people and change the world. And I'm like, most people don't want to be saved. 
and like don't really believe they it. don't want to be saved. I, but, agree. Well, I think I can help a few people. I think that will have fun along the way. That was a right. big thing for me. I wanted to have some fun, which people are like, it's therapy. You're talking about trauma and pain and death and sadness. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah. And my job is to get you to a good place so you're having fun again. Mm-hmm. Like my job is to help you get back to fun. I find that fun. Um, so I've been really happy, but that is, it's a really long journey, right? Like it's right. not a short, like, oh, I just knew and took this great class. I'm no, like, how do I, I do all this? It was, it was you know, a the, long journey. I feel, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I feel like the best therapists are the ones that have like a little bit of a bumpy journey to get to where they are versus like the straight and narrow, right? So, um, I just think it makes them more rich and, and much more exciting. So do you want to dive into a listener's questions? Absolutely. Okay. So here's the question. Okay. So Charlie says, my wife and I are constantly fighting about money. We just disagree on how to have a budget, where we spend our money, what to do about saving. We can't be calm about it and always leads to a major blow up. So now we just avoid talking about it all the time. We've had such big arguments that sometimes we don't speak to each other for days until we cool down and we can never really agree on a plan. It's affecting all parts of our relationships. How can we resolve this? Where do we even start? Can you please help us? So I know you're like, love to talk about money. So this is why we're here to talk about money. I love talking about money as well. So tell me the things. What what would you say? All right. Well, so first let's talk about why I like to talk about money. I'm not an accountant or a finance person. I'm not like love money by like, because of the numbers. I love money. That's a good disclaimer. You're not an accountant. We're not giving money advice. This is not what this this episode's about. Right. Exactly. I love talking about money because he, Charlie put his finger on it. It shows up everywhere. It shows up at the grocery store. It shows up in your savings. It shows up on what house you build. It shows up in your life all the time. So you got to have it figured out so you don't fight all the time. Mm -hmm. That's why I like talking about money. Right. Mm -hmm. And I really feel for Charlie. He is Dude. not alone. I hear this all the time. With I w- totally with agree with you. I, yeah. I would say probably like the couples that I work with, money is for sure like the top four or like third top, fourth or fourth, third topic they're fighting about. Yeah. And if they don't think they're talking about money, eventually you go far enough and oh, wait, there's shit up. There's mm-hmm. money. Right. We thought we were fighting about the kids' school, but it turns <laughs> out, oh, we're actually talking about how we private versus public school and money and all that good stuff. So Charlie's not alone. I feel for him. Mm -hmm. The cycle he's in, that's where I really feel. One of the places I start with a lot of my couples um, is how did your parents talk about money? Mm. And I know that's such a therapist question. (laughs) But yeah, how many of us did your parents not talk to it in front of you? You just saw a closed door. Or I remember from my own childhood, like you always knew when the end of the month was because there was always a fight that you would hear in another room and be like, oh, don't ask mom and dad for anything today. Right. But I didn't actually witness it. I didn't see the resolution. I didn't see how they found a, an idea. I don't know why. I mean, I do now because I went back as an adult and asked them. But as a kid, I had no idea why they were having it every month. Mm-hmm. And that's where I would start, right? Like, did you even learn how to have a conversation about money? Right. What about your – like, you're not the only one here. So what about your partner? Does your, how did they talk about money, right? There's a lot of bad habits out there that we mm-hmm. learned from our parents and we don't even know we learned it from our parents. Yeah. And I think diving it, like I, I get, yes, it is very like classic therapist. Tell me about your childhood. <laughs> um, and the reason why it's important to go there and why we ask these questions all the time is because, you know, I always explain to clients, it's like our brain when we're children is like wet cement. And over time it starts to harden as it should. And in those early years, basically zero to five years, zero to eight, it's like people are putting imprints in that concrete, right? As it, mm-hmm. as it hardens. And that's what we're left with. And so money is one of them. Not only how they talked about it, how they didn't talk about it, but also things like when I think about my own childhood, because my parents did go through phases of like having and then not having, was just the comments of like, we can't do that, we're broke. Or we can't afford that. Right? And it's like, well, what does that mean to a child? So how often were you told your parents couldn't afford something? How often were you told you can't do X, Y, and Z, join the sports team, get the pair of jeans you really wanted or get the, whatever it is that you wanted because of limiting of funds. And what was that tone? 
And what was the emotion attached to that tone? Was it frustration? Was it shame? Was it anger? Like what, you know, what were all the pieces that come with those conversations and also what we observed? Because that leaves us with a very emotional sense of money. We like to think that we outgrow it or it doesn't matter because our life is different now, but we just, we're, we just don't like it's, it sits in there and that's yeah. our default. And even like I told you about the risks I took and like mm. some of the decisions I made, right? The whole, I have to get a job. Well, there's two parts of it. Right. I've been told from a young kid, you're 18, you're an adult, get the fuck out of our house. Right. But the flip side of that is I also knew my parents would all, I had this kind of security of like, yeah, if I really needed it, my parents were going to invite me back in. So I can take a risk that right. somebody whose parents who can't give them that option can't. Right. So I'm going to think about my choices differently. 100%. Right? You're so right. It, I it's mean, that it's, safety net, right? Because that's also a part of the, the question to ask yourself. Like, did I have a safety net or did I feel like I had a safety net mm -hmm. um, from my parents when it came to to financial things? Because that determines risk. You're right. Like we're more likely to take maybe something that's a bit more riskier when we feel like there's something to come back to. But if there's nothing to come back to, then the risk we take is actually a lot smaller. And yeah. this is a really important thing to talk about in relationships with like couples, because if you're not, if we don't ask these questions, people don't share it because- yeah. We hold a lot of shame around money. We it's like we hold embarrassment. Like I know my my parents are both immigrants to this to Canada. We went through times of I would say like I would say poverty, right? Like we were buying secondhand clothes. Um, my parents were renting us a, a small space where we shared bedrooms, and there's shame attached to that. And yeah. so we don't, I don't, I don't show up in my relationship. Like, oh, let me tell you about my most shameful stories when I was a child. <laughs> like we, we just don't do that. I mean, maybe we should, we, if we did, it'd probably be better, but we don't do that. So if we're not taking inventory of ourselves and not asking these questions for an inventory of a partner, we'll never know. So I think that's a really great place to start. You're right. The second reason I always start there is, you know, he's talking about this cycle. They've entrenched themselves. They're angry. They're pissed. Why does she always do this? Why does he always right. do this? You got to rebuild up your compassion. And it's hard to have compassion for who you are today. It's a lot easier to have compassion for that kid who got that story, who got that that lesson, who Such a good had point. that image. And so you, in order to, to, to come in a little bit calmer, you got to start with compassion. So go into the past, you can have, you can have compassion for that eight-year-old, that 10-year-old, that 12-year-old right. and kind of start from there. And that slows things down. And one of the things he says is, oh, they, they have these big fights. And I'm like, you know what? Then you're doing too much. You need to slow down right? Slow way, way down. I tell people to have money days. And I tell oh, them- Oh, I know. We, we talked about this. I love That's this. Right. And I tell them to do it for two reasons. The first is we, want, we don't want to talk about it. So we're like, let's just do it all today. So we're going to take five hours on a Sunday. Well, I guarantee you're going to have a fight. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be pissed off. You want it to be over. You are going to have a fight. But guess what? If you do it one hour, like every other week, if you just spent one hour this Saturday, you don't have time to ask any other question than that first one we just posed. Right. Because at that hour mark, you're done. You got to wait two weeks. Right. To have for the, the next, next money day. day. Yes. For the next money day. I also tell people on their money dates, the consistency is going to chill everybody down. If I know I'm talking to you on Saturday about money, then you know what? Maybe I don't have to have this fight right now. So it chills the rest of the week out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and allows people to think about how they want to engage in that date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So it's like pre-planning, pre-thinking. And, and this is like, we talk about visualization, right? Like this is what visualization is, is thinking about a future thing and how you want that to go, how you want to show up in that space. And then maybe the questions that you maybe want to ask, yeah. because I think that that's really important when we pin it for something in the future, it feels less crisis and it feels like, okay, I can enter this conversation a little bit more calmly. Yep. Yeah. The second place I think they're getting stuck is they're focusing on, I mean, look, I love a good budget worksheet. I follow so many budgeting <laughs> gurus on YouTube, whatever, like, sure, it sounds great. I should spend 30% here and 10% here and 5% here. Yes. And this is the perfect allocation right. to mm -hmm. pay off our debt in six months. It's awesome. And you're going to fight all day long. So how do you not have the fight, even though you have this beautiful, wonderful, perfect, logical plan? Well, on one of your money dates, after you've talked about your family, mm -hmm. but before you're talking about your numbers, 
you got to sit down and talk about what your values are, right? Oh my gosh. Say more like values in general or values about money. So everything, right? So think about, I told you the story of how I made a decision to move out to California Mm. and then I quit technology and moved into therapy. Those are big risky moves Mm -hmm. for somebody whose values are stability and consistency Mm -hmm. and safety. Those were risky, risky moves. Right. But my values don't align with that. Those would have been really, to stay in that field or that industry or in Virginia, those would have been incredibly risky moves for me. Right. I talked about like, hey, if I go back to tech, I'm probably either going to get fired <laughs> or I'm going to quit in five years, right? That's 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 crazy. Why would you, of course, mm. I have to make a different decision. Right. Why? Because I value being engaged. I value um, learning. I value change. Those are things I value. And so, of course, I'm going to put more effort in. So they end up being the safer choice. They right. end up being the right choice. So financially, I think I'm in a way better place today than I was in because I have so much more control because I put so much energy into right. this business because I care about it. Right. And I didn't care about that. Right. Right. So you got to know what those values are. They say they have these fights. I always call it the pineapple fight. Because I had this couple I remember that came in and he was like, why does she have to buy the pine- the cut pineapple from whole paycheck, whole foods? I'm so over it. It's it, it. And she's like, it's a fucking dollar. Right. Why? Like they're thinking they're talking about money. Like it's a dollar. It's this and that. Why are we like, and we have this fight about pineapple every week. Because you go to the grocery store every week. We're having this fight right. every week. Everybody has a version of the pineapple story. Right. But when you really dig in. He's valuing being economical because he feels incredibly insecure about money. So he needs to save every single dollar because he needs to save it for their emergency fund and for their retirement. And she thinks being unhealthy is incredibly dangerous and unsafe. Right. Right. We go back to their family. Oh, she had a sick mom. Right. Oh, he had dad who was always living on a paycheck to paycheck. So, oh, we right. got our family stories. We're right. showing up in our values. So now we're finding about pineapple. Mm-hmm. But if we look at the pine, having cut pineapple saved her time, which meant she actually ate fruit, which meant she was investing in her health. Right. With, that meant that that dollar was 100% worth it to her. Right. And it was 100% not worth it to him. Right. So you got to start there because now we can have compassion. Now he's not a cheap asshole and she's not spending all my money. Right. Now, wait, we, we have real people having real problems. Yeah. Does it solve your pineapple issue? No, we, well, that's step three, but you got to start there. Oh, it's, it's just the most powerful thing to do. Because if someone's values integrity, then they would see anything outside of a budget, agreed upon budget as lying or breaking the rules. Yes. Or, or like just being outside of integrity. Like you don't care about me and you don't respect me and all the things because they maybe value integrity really high. And if you're in a partner, let's say that values generosity and they were moved to give someone 50 bucks or give a homeless person $20 or whatever it is, because generosity is important to them. It's not about not following the budget. It's not about not being respectful of the agreement. It's just like they're fulfilling different values. Yes. And so they're arguing about values. They're not really arguing about money. And I think that's such an important thing to realize that it's really about value set than anything else. Yeah. Now the problem here, and where a lot of people get stuck, like maybe they don't know they're ta- arguing about values, but they are. But now you're like, okay, great. I know my values. I know her values, but her values are fucking stupid and his are pain right. in the ass. I'm like, what are we going to do now? So that's when we go to step three, which is, and this is the boring part that everybody wants to check out on, but you- <laughs> <laughs> I call it, you got to know your numbers. You oh, can want to be yes. all day long. You can want yes. to save for retirement all day long, but you got to actually know your numbers. And yeah. I say, you don't have to know. Like, I love the gurus who are like, go back three months because I love a good spreadsheet. Right. But the reality is you just got to know three. What okay. you owe, what you earn, what you spend. You got to be on the same page. If you can't okay. even agree on that, you can't even have the fight about where you're, are right. you giving 20 bucks to charity, this and that, like, and when I say spend, I mean the bare, like shelter, food, date, like the basics, not the fun stuff, not the, you know, like the basics for survival. You got to know what you earn, what you spend, what you owe. 
And if you guys can't agree on those numbers or you don't know those numbers or you're just trusting him, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So what I know is going to happen, people are going to be like, well, what I think we should spend on what's necessary, my partner doesn't actually think is necessary. So let's say um, kids' soccer fees or sporting fees or subscription to Netflix or like where, how do you navigate? Hey, I, I go, go to the Maslow's hierarchy and ease. Like, <laughs> is, it food? is it shelter? Is it healthcare? Like soccer? I love it. I think it's great. And look, I'm a mental health therapist. I'm right. going to say all those things are wonderful, yes. but I don't need it to survive because right. we're, we're fighting about those. We got to figure those out. When I say spin, I'm talking about like basic, you have a rent payment. You yeah. have a mortgage payment. Like, right. What is that? Fuel for your vehicle because you're commuting to work, right? Exactly. Like maybe car payments if you haven't got a car or, yeah. you know, oh, utility and- payments, like so you can have heat in, in your house. Like those, those are the spending pieces. Those are requirements to live the basics of life. Everything else is, is it's- bonus. So start there. And they're not bonus for living a life, but they are mm. bonus for this, this first conversation. Right. Right. Because it's going to reveal a lot. Like I just said, hey, your housing is a basic. Right. But if you're super resentful because you don't think you need to be spending this much on housing because you don't agree that you should be in this school district or you don't think you need that fourth bedroom or you don't think – or or you're resentful that we're living in one room and and we should have two or whatever. Like you need to have that conversation before we start fighting about soccer practice and network subscriptions and all those good stuff. Like that, again, that goes back to your value. Mm -hmm. I value, like in my housing situation, I live in the Bay Area. It's freaking expensive. This conversation comes up all the time. It's probably why it's top of mind for me. I, (laughs) I value privacy. So I'm willing to pay a little bit more for living by myself. Mm -hmm. I value being able to walk. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pay a little bit more for those two things. You know what I don't value? I don't value how close the nearest bar is. Right. I don't value um, how close the highway is. I don't value um, having a ton of space. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm defining what I do value and what I don't value. And so therefore, if I'm spending money on those first two values, I'm not going to resent it. And if I'm spending money on those last three values, I'm absolutely going to resent it. It's so interesting because I think most people don't even have these conversations. Yeah. Like when I think about, um, I live in a a townhouse and when I was, um, so I had a house house and I was like, this is too much. It's too much for me. It was after my husband had died. And I was like, I was ready to let go of the house. And, and the, the maintenance of a house was way too much for a single person. And when I was looking for a place to live and with a realtor, I was like, she was like, well, what do you, what do you want? Like, what is, what is the value for you? And I thought it was really interesting that a realtor was asking me this question. I'm like, I value like privacy. I value quiet. Like, I don't want to be in the middle of the city because my workers already feels like a lot of work and I want my home to feel serene and peaceful, but I also needed extra space because I want to ho- I love to host people. So my parents come and so they're like, I-, I want people to be able to come to my home and stay. So I needed some extra bedrooms. Um, like I love a beautiful kitchen cause I love to cook. So it's like this interesting thing that we are doing sometimes on our own, or sometimes we're thinking about like the housing that we want, but we're not talking about it with our partners. Well, where people usually start is they're like, oh, well, this is how much income we have. So we can afford a $500,000 house right. or a million dollar mortgage. And I'm right. like, cool. But that doesn't mean you're going to live where you want to live. That doesn't mean you're going to stop right. fighting. You want to stop fighting. It's not about how much can I afford. It's starting with what do I, where am I going to spend the dollars I have? And right. only after that do we go, okay, now how much house can right. I afford? Which is why we're not on the budget yet. Right. That's why we're starting with like, how much are we spending? Right. And you might, and, 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 and you guys are spending a certain amount right now and right. forget about your disagreement. Just look at last month, just pull up last month. How much did we spend? Period. Just know what your number is. Let the right. fight go. Just start there. But where you're going to take it is that's why we did the values before we even right. had the numbers. That's why I said, Oh, numbers is step three. It's right. not step one or two. It's step three. Right. First, we build compassion. Then right. we know our values. Then we know our numbers. Right. 
And we haven't what? gotten to the negotiation yet. Okay, we haven't gotten to Charlie's fight. We we're not even <laughs> we're not even doing the conflict resolution yet. Yeah, and think about it. We if we're doing this in money dates, mm-hmm. this is a bare minimum of three money dates, but probably this is closer to five or six. I was gonna say it's probably a few months. Yes, right. So we've got six months mm. before we haven't even talked about the budget yet. And right. you're thinking, but we got to figure this out now. And I'm like, you can want that all day long and you're still not going to get it. You're just going to have your fight right. and we'll talk about it. You right. got to go slow. You're going to go slow to speed up. Right. So you got to slow down. So you're mm-hmm. having these money dates, you're slowing down. And what are you doing in these money dates? You're starting with your simple goal. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I think they're full of shit, but I'm going to follow Elizabeth and Cecilia's plan. I'm going to talk like, I'm just going to ask her. Well, guess what? Even if you think we are ridiculous, and you go in and you ask this question, you are not going to leave that date without having a little bit more compassion for your partner. You're just going to know so much more yes. like about this other person that you have built a life with. Now, Charlie doesn't say how long him and his wife have been together, but if even if you've been together 20 years, if you've never had this conversation, you are going to discover something completely different from your partner yeah. that you've never really understood before. And I think that those puzzle pieces suddenly start to fit. You're like, oh, shit. Now it makes sense that this happens because of this, yeah. right? And when you have that, there's, there is more compassion naturally. When you understand another person that you already love, mm-hmm. there's going to be some more compassion there. And I think that's such an important piece. And it also changes over time. So part of the reason I call it money dates and not just like a one and done right. is because, you know, in my twenties, I really valued flexibility right? because of course I don't have kids. I don't have family. Like, yeah, I want flexibility. Now I really value health, Mm -hmm. right? I don't know what I'm going to value in 20 years. It might be stability. It might be security. It might be safety. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. Mm -hmm. The money dates are a consistent way to like check in on these. Mm -hmm. Like this is not a one-time conversation. Like you don't need to have this conversation every week, but values conversation, have it at least once a year. Right. Well, and people think it's so unsexy. It's like, oh, it's just such a, it's not a fun conversation. Like, it's like, I'd rather you talk about other things. So I, I tell people, do not have booze in there. When you're talking about money, do you not drink. Booze. I agree. It's Sober, not- coffee, tea, whatever you want to drink, but do not do this with any kind of booze because it'll turn into a fight like that. I, absolutely. So I do it with, with waffles because oh, I love waffles that. Are treats. you don't want to do it often, but like, it is hard for me to get upset when I've got sugar and carbs in my body. That's and such so a good- <laughs> I do it Sunday morning with waffles. Love it. But I had a couple and I love that they did this and I wished I could do this. Um, and, and, you know, maybe one day I'll get there, but I'm just <laughs> not there yet. But, oh my God, I love that they did it. They're like, okay. We hate, they hated, they hated this conversation. They so right. did not want to do this. So they're like, okay, you know what we're going to do? They dropped their kids off at grandma and grandpa. Mm-hmm. They came home. They got naked. They had mm-hmm. the entire conversation naked with the timer. And at the end of it, they went and had sex. <laughs> like, I love that. And fabulous. And, and I love it. And, and <laughs> they're doing like, you don't have to do that. But the point is they were like, Hey, let's make it fun. It's just hard to get really upset when you're hanging out naked. It's so Dude, true. I don't want to piss my partner off because I want to go have sex afterwards. Right. So I want to rein myself in. So we're and positive three, motivation, right? We're doing right? the positive kind of like carrot in front of somebody. Yes. Exactly. And they set a timer. So it didn't matter how deep right. they were. Like it's over in an hour. We'll talk about it again next week. Oh, I love and, it. And back to their bedroom, right? And because they had kids, like that was really, really valuable. Like it's hard to find that time. I don't know if that would work so well if your kids right. are gone or whatever. Right. But for them, finding two hours is hard. Mm-hmm. So having grandma and grandpa take care of it and grandma and grandpa are thrilled that it's on a Saturday morning instead right. of a Wednesday, Thursday night. Sure. Kind of thing. So it just, it worked so well for them. So I always tell people like, make it fun. Like it's okay. Yeah. So it's not fun. Do something for me. It's sugar and carbs for them. It was nakedness and sex, whatever your jam is, as long as it's not substance induced, I say, do it. Do something that fits you. I think that the other thing about, I mean, again, there's a lot of great things, people out there talking about money, but it's like the talking about a very specific way of doing it. And sometimes we get stuck in like, well, this person says to do it this way. So we're going to do it this way. Instead of just Finding something that works for you, that works for your lifestyle, your time, your energy, your reward is yours. Like 
it's okay to customize this process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody brought up the other day, they asked me like, could they do it on a walk? And I was like, you carry a computer in your phone. You can absolutely, like maybe 20 years you couldn't, but now your phone, your phone has every spreadsheet you got on it. You go take a walk, go do what you got to do. Absolutely. So true. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So that's part of the reason I talk about money. Like, again, we're trying, sure. Can you sit down for 10 hours and have this conversation? Yeah. And you're going to be angry and you're going to hate it and you're going to fight. And if that works for you, I'm not going to, I'm not here to tell you no, but they're writing in because it's not working. And so this is an alternative. Set up a system, do these money dates, create a little bit of fun, create a timeline. Right. And so Mm -hmm. here, like we're six months in, we're finally having a conversation about know your numbers. Right. Right. Now here's the thing. The reason I focus on three numbers is because, I mean, this isn't, always the case, but I am shocked by how consistent it is that there's one person in the relationship who has no clue. No clue. I agree. There's one person that has 6,000 spreadsheets. Yeah. And they think if they just find the right version of the spreadsheet, that suddenly their partner will understand everything. And the other person, the one that doesn't know is like, stop logicing, logicing me to death. Stop overwhelming me with these spreadsheets. Stop like you're always right, but it just doesn't work. Like stop doing this. Right. And so you end up with this fight there. And so I picked three numbers because there's no excuse not to know three numbers. Right. This isn't a spreadsheet. Like this is three numbers. Right. You can know three numbers, no matter how much you don't care. You can know three numbers. So agree. Because I think it's, you know, I think that what people don't realize in relationships and dynamic of relationships, because we both talk about this in our sessions with people is that it's, really unfair for one person to carry the burden of the financial responsibility in a relationship and in a family. So if you had kids in there, it's even, if it's even a heavier burden. Yeah. And so it's, it, it, it there's it, this so much resentment in that space when it comes to They're money. both resentful. Yes. The person who doesn't know is tired of being, they always have to ask. Yes. And now you feel like a child and you're Yes. Pissed. I don't want to ask for permission. I don't want, I don't want a, uh, an I allowance. I pineapple I want, right? Right. Like, Yes. And the other person's like, but you're not engaged and you have no idea. And I'm stressed about this and I'm stressed about that. And the person's like, why are you so stressed? There, there's enough, there has to be more money there. It's like, well, if you don't know, like you're both building resentment over something and the power differential is a really big problem. Yeah. And from personal experiences, it mostly seems, I, this is a very generalized assumption I'm making. It's not true for everybody, but most of the time it's men that typically are running the thousand worksheets and women who are like, yeah, I'm not just that interested. Now that's, I believe it's socially conditioned to women to not know math. We tell girls when they're little, they're not good at math, right? We're like, boys are good at math. Girls, do you You're take talking care of your science majors. Yes. Like, talk, talk, no. to every, talk to people and be worried about feelings. And, and so women feel really insecure about money. They just, they're like, I don't know what to do. I don't understand it. I feel dumb. So I don't want to do it. Right. And so, and that potentially comes from their family stuff. Like maybe they watch their mom not know what's going on. So it's just an assumed gender role that happens. Right. Or someone grows up watching their dad managing everything. So it's like, oh, I have to do this because this is what I grew up watching. And so there's also gender pieces that come into play that I think kind of create a little bit more complication and and conflict with people Mm -hmm. because they're not really looking at it that way, like gender wise. Like if you think about everyone who speaks about money, most of them are men. Oh, Most yeah. financial planners are men. Yeah. People in banking are mostly men. It's not really a safe place for women. And so when you're in a relationship with a man and they seem very confident about money and investing, it's like, well, I'm not confident. So I'll just let you do the things. Like I'm happy to let you do everything because I don't want to feel dumb and stupid. And so some of this is, is working through some of those pieces around, you know, is how confident do you feel about knowing some of these things instead of being hands off to say, well, you can build confidence. You can understand these things and that it's not rocket science. It's more of an emotional response that you're having yes. to the idea of money. And and I think people confuse making a good financial decision with just being aware and participating in the decision-making process. Do you have to know all the funds that your right. partner has you invested in? No. No. Do you need to take part in the decision that investing for retirement is important? Yes. He can handle, like he or she or whoever is doing it, like they can handle the details. That's why I say you just have to know the top level number, but you have to be bought in to the actual decision. 
I agree. But implementation, that that's on who's good at it, who's competent, who wants to, whatever. But the decision itself, you cannot abdicate that. Mm-hmm. Or you're going to end up so alone. I don't care how well, long. Well, and both people feel lonely in it. Yes. Right? So, and the other piece of it too is like, because of personal experiences of, of having my husband die, is I'm constantly telling people like, you need to at least know what's happening because what if something happens? Mm-hmm. Because at some point, someone in this relationship is going to die, whether it's today or 20 years from now or when you're 80, or it doesn't really matter. Like the truth is none of us get out of this alive, right? Like we're all going to die at some point. And when you have in your relationship and you have combined income, and if you don't know where the bank accounts are, you don't know what is invested, you don't know where your mortgage is being held, you don't, if you don't know any of these things, it is so impossible to learn this in the midst of grief. And so out of love and respect for each other, there needs to be, these dates need to happen because it's, it's, it's recognizing that, that, that the, it's to the safety of the other person. Right. And to connect in this way, to be like, you need to know some of the basics. Both people need to understand what's happening because if the shit hits the fan, like money matters. Well, I talk to so many couples who show up. I mean, you make a great point about grief and dying, but even before that point, Mm -hmm. so many couples who come in and it's not so much that somebody wants to leave, but they feel trapped. Yes. If I left. And so right. then they're having this like almost pre-resentment. They don't even want to leave. They just, the <laughs> resentful of the fact that they think. <laughs> and it's like, well, but all you have to do is participate in the decisions and have right. a little awareness right. and you're not going to feel trapped. It's so, so true. Right. And I, so and, I true. Just, and again, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to become a second money manager next to your partner. You just have to participate. Yes. Be willing to participate. So mm-hmm. scheduling money dates. Scheduling money dates. Know your numbers. Okay. Now you know your numbers. Yes. You're doing this. Okay. All right. But now we actually, now we have the value. Now we have to actually talk about it. Okay. okay great. I know my numbers, Liz, but I still think he sucks. I right. still think she spends, spends too much. Too much. Adult, sure. Right? Sometimes you can compromise, sometimes you can negotiate, but chances are, if you've been married long enough, you've already kind of reached some of those. You need to check in, where am I resenting it? I don't have to buy pre-sliced pineapple. I'm not going to resent not buying pre-sliced pineapple. But you know what I am going to resent? I am going to resent that you make me go to Costco and not a grocery store with a good apple selection. Right. Okay, why? Because... My time is important. Like I care about investing right. in my time and my family and my health. Right. So can I make a compromise on the pineapple? Yes. Can I compromise on where I do my shopping? Actually, that feels really resentful to me. Right. Okay. So now I know the resentment factor. What causes resentment? What doesn't? If it doesn't cause resentment, negotiate, compromise, find your way through. You right. got it. All right. But I'm resenting the heck out of you. Okay. This is when you got to start like, when I tell you go to couples counseling because they will help you through this, <laughs> but use a lot of those skills. I always tell my clients, uh, put an experiment in place. Everybody resents having to do things for the rest of time. Right. Very few of us resent having to do something for two weeks. Totally agree. Can I go to Costco for two weeks and see how it goes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. Not happy about it. I still think you're wrong, but I can do it for two weeks. We can see what happens. But guess what? Afterwards, the next two weeks. I'm going to go to Whole Foods Mm -hmm. and we're going to try that experiment. So we're going to try experiment after experiment after experiment. And part of designing an experiment is you set a time limit. Yes. And what are we trying to figure out? What are we paying attention to? And then third, on our money, like the money date we just put on the schedule for two weeks out. And this is why you do it after six months. You already got in the Mm -hmm. habit of having your money date. You already have the habit of doing it every two weeks. You already have the habit if it's an hour long. Okay, in an hour, we're talking about how the experiment went. Right. Can we, right, like what's going on here? Well, and I think the key of that is like really putting on a scientific hat, which is we're going in with an open mind mm-hmm. and a really fucking great attitude. Because if not, then we're tainting this experiment, right? When we talk about like, you know, scientific experiments, we have to be open-minded to the possibility that I'm wrong, <laughs> 
because the whole point is like I'm I have a hypothesis I'm guessing this is the way it's going to go but I'm open to the the possibility of actually being wrong Mm -hmm. so it requires some humility which you've built because you've had compassion yes yes what what is going on here hey this isn't about that they being right. like right. being in Whole Foods. This mm-hmm. is about they they care about their health. And so how can we be the most healthy with right. the money we have, right. right? So we're starting to do that. And now we're starting to get to the budgets. Because, right. and again, that's part of the reason we have to start with the know your numbers before the experiments. Right. Because look, if you only have a hundred bucks for food. That's all you got. Eh, that's all you got. So how, right. but now it's, okay, we have a hundred bucks. How can we invest in mm-hmm. health? And, and respect the hundred dollars. Right. Yeah. Maybe we aren't going to Whole Foods, but maybe we can go to Whole Foods or the farmer's market like once a month. Right. But these other times we have to sign up for this Amazon fresh program right. that can deliver for a quarter right. of the price. Maybe it, that means, et cetera, right? So true because I think it's like, it's, this is like the most important word in therapy is the word and. Yes. Yes. Like it really just says, it's not this or this. It's like, well, this and this. And in relationships, it's this and this. It's me and you, not me, but you, right? It's me and you, my values and your values, my needs and your needs. And I think that in conflict that was Charlie is talking about is that it turns into, no, it's not an and, right? We're in competing about who's right and who's going to win. Yes. Right. And sometimes there isn't a compromise. Right. But if you time gap it, you can make the compromise. So I totally agree. An example um, would be, a really great example is you love travel. That's a really core value of yours. You want to expose your family to new experiences. You want to get out there. It helps you reset and revitalize. Like it's really important to you. Okay, great. His value is safety. He needs to save money. He's anxious. He's he's right. just really, really worried about it. Okay. Well, look, it's 2024 while we're filming this. Mm-hmm. Everybody's freaked out about a recession and has been for two years. Mm-hmm. Lots of people are being laid off. This is a point where you go to your partner and you go, hey, you're anxious. Like, this is a reality. Like, you're really worried about being laid off. I can compromise and let's not – we're not going to travel for one year. But we're going to revisit in one year. And here's the key one I always tell people. I'm like, okay, if she's going to compromise for you, like, we're not going to travel for one year so you can save money in case you get laid Mm. off so you feel more comfortable, okay? Because you haven't been laid off. This is pure fear in your head. Mm. And it's probably based in like really good facts, but like Mm -hmm. it's still just a fear, right? Right. So she's compromising her value of travel for your fear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, fine. She's going to do it for, you put a time limit on it. It's just for one year. You put it on the calendar. This is when we're revisiting. But three, what does she need to do it without resentment? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're not going to travel this year, but then we're going to Paris for two weeks without the kids. We're dropping them off at your parents, even though you don't like doing that. Because right. that's for me. So we did this year for you. We're doing the Paris trip for me. Right. Now, it's not a guarantee in stone. Like, what if he does lose his job and your whole sure. new translation? That's why you're talking about it all the way around. Right. But we're addressing the fact that there's going to have to be something on the other end. Because, again, this isn't an and situation. We can't travel right. and save money when we have this level of anxiety and right. fear in the system. So it's having compassion. We know like, hey, you're worried about this because you have this entire history of your dad losing his job over and over again. Hey, like all the people around you are losing your family. Like, I love you, right? Like, I love you. I don't want you to be this scared. I don't want to add this extra pressure. So I'm committed. So now we're making this decision together, Mm -hmm. but I'm making the decision to forgo my value here. But that means I need you to prioritize my value next year. And it may or may not be Paris. It may or not be this super expensive thing, Mm -hmm. but like- my m- whatever financial situation we're in next year, I need you to prioritize my value right. since I'm prioritizing yours, right? Yeah, and that's and such that, a good point. That's how you get through these fights. That's how you yes, stop fighting. I agree. So mm. important. So much. This was so good, Elizabeth. How can people find you? Where do they, they find you? They can go to my website, elizabethmcginnis.com. They can find me on Instagram, though I'm a very slack poster, so you won't get a ton from me. But it's <laughs> at psychotherapy, um, my initial psychotherapy. All the links um, will be in the show notes anyways. But yeah. And again, I'm a very slack, slack poster, but I am mm. on YouTube and you can find me at EM Psychotherapy on YouTube. And you also have a Money Enough quiz. 
I do. Which is lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's on my website. You can go to my couples page. It's at the yeah. bottom. It's we'll put right a link there. in it in the show notes for sure. And I just think it's really great because it just helps you figure out like what are some mm. of your patterns um, because people don't – like he's t- he talked about it. And that was such a great question. He acknowledged we get really anxious, so we right. have this – and then we avoid the hell out of it. Like, right. But a lot of people don't have that self-awareness, so the quiz is really to help you build – Some self-awareness, which is great. Yeah. So great. Well, Elizabeth, um, we, I started a tradition on this podcast, which okay. I did not tell you ahead of time, <laughs> where the previous guest has left a question for you without knowing Ooh. who you are. Okay. Okay. So the question for you is, how would you describe the soundtrack of your life and which song would be playing during the most memorable moment? Oh my God. I love this question because when I go skiing, I put in the soundtrack and I'm like, I'm in a movie and I'm the star and I've gotten the soundtrack. <laughs> in my head. So that's, that's totally what I do. Love um, it. The question is what it is. It's probably, I wish I had some like deep dark one, but it's like wake yeah. me up from Avicii. Like I, I love, love that song because I feel like we all need to be waking up from our life a I little bit it. sometimes. And if I'm at a turning point, it's me waking up and making like a choice. Right. Love um, it. So yeah, it's Wake Me Up from Avicii. Oh, that's so great. Elizabeth, thanks so much for being on the podcast. You're welcome. Thank you. 